The following message was delivered at Westminster Presbyterian via audio recording. The speaker is our ministerial advisor, Pastor Miller Ansel of Trinity Presbyterian in Waco, Texas. It was delivered on December 3, 2023. It is based upon Genesis chapter 16 verses 1 through 16 and it is titled The Impatience of Abraham. Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, May wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress, and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Berid. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. As far as the reading of God's word, let us pray. Our Master and our God, we desire to hear the preached word, although in ourselves we are certainly weak and needy in this task. Yet we do long to be edified with divine truth, so send your Spirit to give us assistance in hearing the preached word that he may lift up our hearts to heaven. May we attend to it now with the power and awakened attention if we grow slothful. Lord, may we be refreshed and convicted. May we be comforted. Lord, use this time to make us holy. Give us this refreshment among your people. Lord, help us not to treat so excellent a matter as defective or mundane. There is no greater news than Christ's redemption through his life, death, and resurrection. And what could be more pressing at this time than our sanctification? So, Lord, have us to pay attention, to grow in warmth and fervency of the gospel. Keep us in tune with you at this time. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Well, certainly, if we saw the devil for who he really is, it wouldn't be so tempting to believe him and to fall into temptation. And surely if we saw sin for what it is and its consequences, it would not be so alluring. But yet daily we are faced with the difficulty of Christian obedience. We daily have to choose to obey God, to not obey God, to give in to sin or to choose righteousness, to choose the hard and difficult path of faithfulness and belief or the very easy path of disbelief and unfaithfulness. Now assuredly, there is always redemption for those who repent of their sins when they do choose the sinful path. And there's always restoration through Christ. But this is a very daily spiritual warfare that we are embattled in. And it's nothing new. We go back to Genesis and we see uh, the very same two options before mankind before, well, before Christians in particular. 
And so we see before us in the spiritual warfare that Abram and Sarai and Hagar are going through, they have two options, right? They have the option of obedience, which we'll call the, the promised land option, and they have the option of disobedience, the Egyptian option. Right? The promised land option obeys the Lord in faith, even though they may suffer now, even though it's difficult, even though they have to be patient and wait more than 10 years for the child to promise. That would be choosing the promised land option to trust God that he will bring them through and they will dwell in this land. The Egyptian option is the shortcut. The Egyptian option is the easy way out. It's the attempt to solve a problem with man's wisdom and not God's wisdom. I'm not just making this up. The Egyptian option plays a role throughout Genesis, and it plays a role throughout the entirety of the Pentateuch. We've already seen it once, right? When Abram came to the land of Canaan, there was a famine, and in disbelief, he goes and chooses the Egyptian option, right? He ran to Egypt. We're going to see it again. Uh, remember, who's writing Genesis? Well, it's Moses. And to whom is he writing it? Well, he's writing it to the Hebrews who have left Egypt, who are in the wilderness wandering. Uh, they're on their exodus. It's no wonder we see this theme throughout this book as well as the rest of the first five books of Scripture. Because Moses is trying to tell the people, don't go back to Egypt. It wasn't good for Abraham. It's not good for you either. Because Christ, as Christians, we are so often interested in the Egyptian option to go back uh, maybe before the time that we knew Christ, to go back to that lifestyle because it was so much easier, so much less suffering. Or maybe if you don't recall a time apart from the Lord, you just simply observe the unbeliever's lifestyle and say, man, that would be easier. Looks more fun. Right? We deal with this. We, we can easily look at the culture around us and choose the Egyptian option when we say, man, the world doesn't have to really deal with issues of, of sexual morality, issues of purity and chastity. They just do what they want and desire, and they're, and they're applauded for it. Maybe I should give in to that desire. Or maybe as students or co-workers, you know those who cut corners in their work, and you know you could get away with it too. It makes work easier. Everybody else is doing it. Maybe the extended lunch break, and everybody else thinks you should take that extended break as well. And that sounds enjoyable, a longer break. Or we talk about the Egyptian option, we can get very real um, and talk about homeschooling. It doesn't look as, it doesn't seem as romantic as it once did, perhaps, before the kids actually came along. I mean, how many times as Husbands and especially the mothers, especially, are embroiled in the challenges of a Christian education and day in and day out, and it's difficult. And the choosing the option to just send the kids to some inadequate school, get a job, have some adult conversation sounds so nice. You ever been there? Let's just say the Christian faces difficulties day to day, daily difficulties, and we have the two options. The promised land option of obedience and running to Christ, which looks like trusting God and maintaining our faith, or we have disobedience, the Egyptian option. We see the Egyptian option played out in two scenes in our text. Scene one, verses one through six, is where Sarai and Abram choose Hagar, the Egyptian option. See, she herself is that option. And then the second scene is verses 7 through 16, where Hagar herself chooses Egypt. So that is Hagar's Egyptian option. And of course, we will conclude with Christ. For those who have chosen to run from God and how often we choose the Egyptian option, um, we'll see how Christ never did, and we are redeemed by him. So first, Hagar herself, the Egyptian option. So Abram and Sarai are faced with a great difficulty, one that's impossible, actually, by man's standards. They've been promised uh, a child, and now we see it's been 10 years. In fact, even after being promised the child, 
God uh, covenanted with them. We've seen the formal covenant last week to give them the child to promise, and they've waited and waited a decade. Now, Abram's 86, Sarai's 76, and they're wondering, where is this child? And they're not getting any younger. And in Scripture, we often find man is presented with impossibilities. But normally, when we read the problem, the insurmountable uh, impossibilities uh, that man faces, we usually read the words, but God. But God does something to save man, to bring them out, to do the impossible. But in our text, we don't read, but God. Essentially, we read, but Sarai. She has her own plan. What seemed impossible, she says, hey, um, how about this? I'll have a child through my servant, Hagar, the Egyptian. Now, likely Hagar came back with them whenever Abram had ran uh, to Egypt. Of course, they left with more than what they came. Uh, He was made rich uh, through that process and Very likely, Sarai's uh, servant here, Hagar, was obtained during that time and has been her servant ever since. And so Sarai thinks she'll obtain uh, a child through her servant. So she gives um, Hagar to Abram as a wife. And the plan works. It's successful. Hagar conceives. Now, on the one hand, many of us go, how in the world can that happen? How could she do that? How how do you bring, right? Because none of us are thinking, uh, especially as a husband, your wife comes home with another woman and says, hey, I got you a second wife. No, no thank you. And it's just not part of our culture. But this, as we think about the Egyptian option, perhaps even in our own day and age, this was very common. It's not unusual for a man to have a number of wives at this time. So the temptation and the answer seems very easy for Sarai. Let's just do what the rest of the culture is doing and fulfill God's promise at the same time. And so she brings Hagar to Abram. So here it is, Sarai, a godly woman, but giving in to temptation. This is her shortcut to obtain the promised child. But honestly, it's no shortcut. We can call it what it is. This is adultery. And uh, no surprise, adultery creates conflict, to say the least, especially once we get children involved. So once Hagar conceives, she looks down on her master Sarai. Sarai knows it, and the drama begins. It's a mess. These first six verses, what a dysfunctional household. Let's ask the question, then who's to blame for all of this? And we see everybody's to blame. Abram, Sarai, Hagar are all to blame for the drama and the difficulty that has been created now in attempting to to fulfill the promise of God in their own way. First, we see Hagar, she is to blame for despising her mistress. I guess I keep saying that, of course. We understand uh, mistress in this sense is the authority, the womanly authority of the household. Uh, So she is despising uh, Sarai, her mistress. Uh, which is not, according to the fifth commandment, how we act for those who are our superiors. We ought not despise them and look down our nose at them. But so Hagar does. We also see Hagar runs from the household. That's the whole second scene. We'll come back to that. So she is wrong for despising her mistress. We see Sarai's wrong. Sarai is pointing the finger everywhere else but herself. It's interesting how humans love to blame everybody else for our sins. Right? Since the Garden of Eden, it's the woman you gave me. It was the serpent. He deceived me. Right? It, if your dog gets into the garbage, you say, no, Bobo, get out of the garbage. Bad dog. And the dog just looks guilty. Have you ever seen a dog raise his paw and say, it wasn't me, it was the guinea pigs? Raise his paw and point at the cat. No. Only humans do that. Only we point the finger at everybody else and not ourselves. Sarai should be pointing the finger at herself for this awful idea. But instead, we find her pointing it at Hagar. We find her pointing her finger at Abram. She's even calling on the name of God to judge. 
certainly an improper use of the Lord's name in verse 5. But you can understand she's seeing red. She is, her self-control is long gone. Perhaps you can just, as you read it, you can see her fuming. She is furious. She is rash. She's out of control, blaming Hagar, blaming Abram, taking the Lord's name in vain. The Matthew Henry, this Matthew Henry quote is, is right on the money. He says, when passion is on the throne, reason is out the door and is neither heard nor spoken. When passion is on the throne, reason is out the door and is neither heard nor spoken. Yes, when sinful, passionate anger is ruling our thoughts and our words and our actions, they are utterly unreasonable and ungodly. So such is Sarai's sin and wrongdoing. She has presented this temptation before Abram. She has given Hagar as a wife. And then she, is, she has ungodly anger. And as Sarai is fuming about yelling at Abram, how does Abram respond? Right? Stop overreacting. You're being unreasonable, just like your mother. Well, not really. He doesn't, he doesn't make that mistake, at least. Honestly, his sin is quite worse. Abram's sin in these first six verses lies in his passivity. It's amazing how husbands uh, can be great leaders outside the home something changes inside those walls. I mean, Abram has been a courageous, godly man. He had the guts to follow God's call to leave his home in Ur and then to leave his father behind in Haran. He was able to take the lead to mend the quarrel between his men and Lot's men. We've seen him actually lead a war party to bring back men, women, and loot. And suddenly, when it comes to his wife, he is passive. And he gives in to his wife's sinful plan. Right? He shouldn't have married Hagar. He shouldn't have slept with Hagar. That's one of his, his first major issue. But secondly, he doesn't deal with the problem problem rightfully in verse 6. Instead of finally doing the right thing, he says, ah, she's your maid. Uh, Do with her as you please. He gives one wife permission to berate his other wife. Certainly polygamy is wrong, but the answer to polygamy is not divorce. And if we run across a polygamous man, he is called to love his wives. He is called to provide for his wives, and he is called to protect his wives. But Abram has cast off his husbandly duties to both of them. He's cast off his fatherly duty to Ishmael in the womb. I think it's very relatable. He just wants the drama to stop. He wants Sarai to just leave him alone. John Calvin wrote, for the sake of restoring peace, Abram does violence to his feelings, both as a husband and a father. Indeed. It's hard to believe if if you're married or you want to be married, this is the truth. It's hard to believe, but great sin and temptation will come from the one that you love. The ones we love more than anybody else in this whole world can and will present us with occasions to sin. It's happened since the Garden of Eden. In fact, the similarities between Genesis 3 and Genesis 16 are very interesting. The similarities between Adam and Abram. We find both men listen to the voice of their wives. We find that both wives take and give to their husbands. We find both husbands abdicate their responsibility to spiritually lead their households in godly obedience. To be clear, the problem's not in listening to your wife. 
In fact, in Genesis 21, Abraham is told specifically by God, listen to your wife. The issue is in attempting to please men over God. The issue is choosing Egypt, the easy way out, over the promised land, which is difficult. Right? We ought always to choose godliness, which means that sometimes wives have to be told no. And sometimes husbands need to be told no. Genesis 16 is an example. Sarai should have been told no. But that's very hard. It's hard to tell the one you love no. My old seminary professor, Dr. Duguid, would put it this way. Obedience to God is more precious to us than our idols of domestic peace and harmony, which we seek to achieve by keeping our spouse happy in every situation. That's for my people pleasers. Because many of us want to be happy. We want those around us to be happy. We hate confrontation, and so we do what we must to obtain peace and felicity. But sometimes we obtain peace and felicity at the expense of holiness and faithfulness. So such are the sins of those involved in this dysfunction in the first six verses. And certainly many exhortations to us as we consider our own households and our lives and our own choosing between godliness and ungodliness. Abram and Sarai chose Hagar, the Egyptian option, because they grew weary of waiting on God. Faith and what they could not see was too difficult, and they wanted the promises of God, promises of God now, instant gratification. But we wait, brothers and sisters. It's difficult. Waiting is not fun. But we wait on God and we remain faithful. Even when we're tempted to take the shortcut, to take matters into our own hands, when we're tempted to just have some peace and quiet, we must resist such a temptation to sin in that manner and continue in steadfastness and patience, clinging to God's promises. So this is the first scene of the chapter. Not a happy one. What Sarai thought would be an option for fulfilling God's promises as well as her own maternal desires, which are good desires, has ended in disaster. So then we come to the second scene, Hagar's Egyptian option as she runs. And this is the sin of Hagar, to return to Egypt rather than remain in Abram's household. She's fleeing on account of verse 6. Verse 6, we read, And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. And I'll say this, dealing Harshly, uh, what does that look like? I don't believe that it's uh, um, a physical abuse, that it's a um, physical violence towards Hagar. Um, that is to say, because the angel of the Lord is going to come to Hagar and say, go back. And I don't want it to be misunderstood that those who are uh, victims of physical abuse ought to remain in the household and continue being abused. So, just to clear that up, certainly, um, if that is a situation uh, that you find yourself in, in that case, flee and, and come to my house. Go to Elder Rogers' house. Give us a call. Go somewhere where you are safe. Nevertheless, I believe the... Uh, I'll, I guess I'll just preach on it. <laughs> but Sarah's dealing uh, harshly with her servants, and I don't believe it's a physical abuse, but more likely a tongue lashing that she is giving her. We've already seen that Sarai is very upset. She's very rash. Um, her words are sinful. Uh, she's not letting reason rule. And so, in fact, as you look the Hebrew up here for what she's going through, it's the idea uh, not of dealing harshly in a physical way, but dealing harshly with her words, that she is oppressing Hagar, that she is humbling Hagar, she is putting her down, that Hagar has become downcast Maybe what makes the most sense in our minds as we find Hagar fleeing is that Sarai has humiliated Hagar. That's the gist of the Hebrew here. And so it makes sense why Hagar would leave, even though it's wrong. And she leaves and she says she's going back to Egypt where she came from. 
we find her on the way to shore. There's literally a road called the way to shore um, here in the Old Testament. Uh, so she's going up to 100 miles, trying to get back to Egypt. And God has allowed her to, grow, to go a great distance. Oftentimes God will uh, give us more sin to punish us or to discipline us in our sin in order that we might be brought back, in order that we might see our need for him. And that seems to be the case with Hagar. She has wandered far in order to be restored. And as she rested by a spring, the angel of the Lord appeared to her, and he asked very two insightful questions. Where have you come from, and where are you going? Where have you come from? She has come from running from her duty in Abram's household. She has come from running from her master. Granted, it's a messed up situation to have one spouse serving the other spouse. Nevertheless, her proper place is to be back in Abram's household, but she has run from it. Where, that's where she's come from. Where are you going, right? Where are you going, the angel asks her. She's going to Egypt. The Egyptian option. The classic response of God's people when things get tough and they want it easy. Even though it's the land of sin, it's the land of idolatry, it's the land of unbelief, God's people often say, let us go back to Egypt. They, they escaped slavery, and even afterwards, they still say, let us go back to the slavery of Egypt, which is a picture in the new covenant of us going back to a life of sin, the slavery of sin. She's headed to Egypt, but the angel of the Lord promises her that when, if she returns to the promised land, her descendants will be multiplied, that she'll have a safe delivery it's a nice promise, isn't it? Your delivery, you'll be safe. And you'll have a boy, and you'll name this boy Ishmael, and Ishmael means God hears, because God has heard her affliction. In the middle of nowhere, on the way to sure, God has heard her affliction. She has been sinned against, most certainly. She's been put down and humiliated, but her response was to flee from home. But God has not turned away from her. He has turned to her. He has turned to comfort her with promises. The angel of the Lord continues in verse 12, describing the kind of man Ishmael will be. Uh, this isn't exactly good news. He's going to be a wild man, literally a wild donkey of a man. That is to say, he will be untamable. He will be defiant against his brother Isaac, against Isaac's descendants, against his neighbors in the Middle East. The tradition is that Ishmael and his descendants uh, wandered around the desert, never settling down and causing trouble everywhere they went. But then we come really to the best part of the chapter, verses 13 and 14, the most encouraging part of this chapter, that all the bad news of verses 1 through 6 takes care of. And it's in verses 13 and 14 we find Hagar's pious reflections upon God's grace. Right? She has... as as awful as her situation is, it has allowed her to hear the gospel where she has come to trust in Christ alone for her salvation, right? The Christ to come. And so in verses 13, 14, she realizes God's grace in her life. She also realizes this is a theophany. This is a Christophany. That is to say, this angel of the Lord is no average angel. This is the Son of God in a temporary incarnate form. We have many of these throughout the Old Testament. We'll have more in Genesis. That is to say, she has been speaking to the Son of God himself, face to face. Hagar realizes this, and what a marvelous privilege for her. She listens to him. She speaks to him. She tells us her thoughts on God's omniscience on his providence, on his love and care for her. Who is Hagar? She's a nobody. She's a foreign slave girl brought from her country to a strange family in a strange land. But this nobody from Egypt is now in a privileged position to meet God face to face, to experience his glory to experience his compassion. 
If you can imagine such an incredible encounter. How comforting for her to be able to say, God sees me. When I am hurting, God sees me. When I'm alone, God sees me. When I'm depressed and humiliated and crying my eyes out, God sees me. And so she names God. She says, you are the God who sees. It's a lot of words in English. Two words, five letters in Hebrew. El Roy. What a great name for a son, to name him El Roy. The God who sees. To be reminded all of his life, God sees him. She even goes on to name the well that she is resting at. Beer Lahai Roy. Which beer just means well. Uh, you tipplers. Uh, she names it Beer Lahai Roy, well of the one who lives and sees me. What an amazing privilege for Hagar. A revival out in the desert, a revival for one. And so we find that Jesus is comforting, that the Son of God is comforting to her. She wipes her tears, she heads back to where she belongs, she returns to Abram and Sarai. She bears her son, Ishmael. There's a lot we can learn from Hagar's encounter with God the Son. One is that he doesn't just dwell with the rich like Abram. He dwells with and has mercy on the poor and the suffering. That God loves all kinds of people, regardless of social status, gender, or ethnicity. That Jesus Christ came to save the world, all nations, through his glorious gospel. Now, the poor are not guaranteed to become materially wealthy, but they are guaranteed to be rich in faith. And even earlier, as we are our uh, call to confession, we talked about spiritual gifts. The poor are also called to enrich the faith of those around them. Especially here, Hagar is going to enrich Abram's faith with her own experience of God. She returned to Abram and she could, she could tell him of the God who sees. The God who met Hagar in the wilderness. And Abram would have seen her repentance and her submission to authority. So our second scene from chapter 16 is much happier. We started with this uh, awful situation in the household. But it's been resolved. It's being resolved. People are being reconciled because of the work of the Son of God in his Old Testament theophanic form. Hagar going with the Egyptian option would not have ended well. She needed to be where the Lord had her, back with her husband, her mistress, and now bearing her son. But let us conclude with Jesus. Let us conclude with Jesus, not, not in his theophanic form, but incarnate forever the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, who humbled himself by becoming man so that he could be faced with the same temptations that you and I are faced with, that he could be faced with the same issues of choosing obedience or disobedience, the Egyptian option or the promised land option. And this Jesus, your Lord and Savior, was always obedient 100% of the time he obeyed. Did that make his life easy? Did it make his life a bed of roses? Quite the opposite. He became obedient even to the point of death, even death of the cross. Why the cross? Your Savior had to go to the cross because Abram would choose Egypt, because Hagar would choose Egypt. Sarai, Israel chose Egypt and the cross had to come because you and I choose the Egyptian option and choose disobedience and sin and the shortcut. We give in to these sinful temptations to please ourselves. And so the cross had to come that we might be redeemed. That he who knew no sin would become sin so that we might be right with God. And it was there on the cross that Jesus took the wrath of God that we deserve bled for his people who disobey him, and he exchanged our sinfulness for his righteousness. Right? Our sin has consequences. 
Sometimes those consequences last a lifetime. Sometimes those consequences last a number of lifetimes, a number of generations. Ask Abram. We can't bury our sin. We can't place it aside. But our sin can be atoned for. And that's the good news for all those who cry out in their affliction, their sinful affliction uh, to God for help, for salvation, who cry out for forgiveness. Because God is a God who hears. Ishmael. God hears. And those who cry out for salvation are atoned for by the blood of Christ. I hope it's encouraging to know God hears us. He sees us. He is El Roy. That even when we are in despair, He is with us always. Right? Hagar in the middle of nowhere. And God is with her. And we know that because God loves us to the point that He would not even spare His own Son but rather would deliver him up for us all. And if he's willing to deliver up his son, how much more will he not give us all good things? He sent his son, gave him up, so that we might have all that he has promised. So let us hope in that. Let us have faith to live that out, to not try and seek God's promises in our own wisdom. Let us be a patient, steadfast people not seeking Egyptian shortcuts, but waiting on God in the midst of life, this side of glory. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, we are grateful that you are the God who sees and the God who hears. Because, Lord, we are a people afflicted with our sins, We are a people afflicted by the sins of those around us. We are a people afflicted with a broken creation. But Lord, may we take comfort that you hear and see us, that you do not leave us. There is nowhere we can go to escape from you. Hagar could not go out in the wilderness. King David knew we cannot go into the depths of the sea, the heights of the heavens to escape from you, Lord. But let us not be those who long to escape. Let us be those who even in our sins, when we have chosen the Egyptian option, that we turn and run to you, knowing, much as the prodigal son teaches, that you will welcome us into your loving arms. So Lord, increase our faith through this preaching of the word, through the sacrament in which we are about to partake. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. For more messages like the one you just heard, visit Westminster Presbyterian online or in person at westminsterbartlesville.org or in person at the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We meet every Lord's Day at 10.30 in the morning and 5 p.m. in the evening. We'd be glad to have you.